Coming up on Digital Music Trends 177, recorded on the 2nd of April 2014, Bandpage raises a new round of funding, Spotify releases a major redesign of its apps, Ardio is the first on-demand service on the Chromecast, Amazon launches its Fire TV box, Last.fm axes its radio service, the filter comes back to the music data space, the latest on a music cubad, and the future of the Topspin platform. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, I'm Andrea Leonelli and this is a weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry and DMT is available as an audio and video show on a variety of channels including the iTunes Store, most podcatching apps including Downcast, YouTube, Soundcloud, Mixcloud and many many more. And to get in touch with the show you can tweet us on at DigiMusicTrends or email contact at DigitalMusicTrends.com. I produced a ton of videos at South by Southwest uh, in March so if you want to go and check them out you can head on to the site look at events and look at South by Southwest and also there should be a podcast feed that goes live on iTunes very very soon hopefully it will be approved uh, this week uh, or uh, at the uh, latest uh, early next week and this week it's a real pleasure to welcome uh, three great guests great guests at the beginning of the show actually at least uh, so starting with Brian Felsen a former president of CD Baby and Book Baby so hi Brian thanks for joining me it's a pleasure to have you how's it going hey it's going great pleasure to be here and uh, also we have uh, uh, Jay Sider uh, from uh, uh, um, uh, Bandpage, so uh, CEO of Bandpage. So hi Jay, how's it going? Very good, thanks for having me. It's great to have you. And uh, we also have uh, Jay Herskowitz, uh, uh, who uh, has been uh, on the show before. It's a real pleasure to have you back, Jay. And he's a music tech consultant and developer who works on a bunch of projects, including Project Tomahawk uh, out of New York City. So hi Jay, and thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me back. And so this week uh, we're going to start uh, uh, by talking about uh, Bandpage. So Jay, uh, that's the reason why you're, you're on this week uh, and it's uh, great to have you. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, so mm -hmm. Bandpage and I had a big announcement uh, this week, uh, which was a new round of funding, uh, your C round essentially. Uh, so mm -hmm. uh, tell us all about it. So how did it all uh, come together and what does it mean for the company? Yeah, so yeah, this week we announced uh, our Series C round, uh, which was $9.25 million uh, from some great investors, GGV and MDV, um, yeah. and uh, yeah, so we're you know going to use the money to continue to grow the company. Our goal, you know, in in this company is to help musicians generate more revenue and, and grow their fan base, and we do that with you know just in a, in a simple. Uh, way, which is helping musicians reach their fans um, on all of the different platforms. Um, yeah. And so we're, we're very focused on, you know, anytime a musician builds a profile on Bandpage and puts up their shows and photos and videos in their store, uh, that we display that um, content and commerce across the platforms that we power. So uh, the, the round is to continue to, to grow the platform partners and, and provide value back to musicians. Absolutely. And this kind of uh, consolidates a comeback of, uh, of uh, Bandpage that has, uh, has been ongoing really for the last uh, sort of 18 months or so. But mm -hmm. uh, I wrote a piece actually that was, you know, talking about how uh, when Facebook changed its timeline, you know, it would mm -hmm. have been hard to bet on Bandpage being able to, to continue as a business. But you've done an amazing work on the, on the back end and, in, in, and diversifying the technology technology and that really has has allowed you to thrive in a different environment mm -hmm. yeah thanks thanks for that I mean we worked really hard you know we in the early days when we started on Facebook we grew r really really rapidly and um, had a, a quite a large user base at that point so uh, we looked at cool you know musicians uh, reach their fans on Facebook but they also, you know, now just that over the past couple of years, the streaming companies and entertainment platforms have really gained a lot of a lot of traction, and actually, um, you know, it can continue to have uh, just an incredible amount of traction and, and traffic and engagement on these other services. Um, and so, <clears throat> over the last, like you said, eighteen months, uh, we we've now done deals and are powering Xbox Music and Vivo, Rhapsody, Clear Channel, Google. Um, you know, and, and the list goes on. Yeah. The one of the coolest deals uh, you know that that just came out was with Lyric Find, which is the largest lyric site in the uh, lyrics distributor in the world. They have over five billion lyric displays a year. Where before, when a fan was looking up lyrics, you know it was uh, there were you'd only see ads on the the right hand side. But now, right. when you look up lyrics, you can see the artist tour dates and store next to it. Again, giving more opportunities to fan, giving more opportunities for fans to buy 
musicians, uh, you know, store items as well as uh, get more fans going to their shows. So, sure. yeah, we, we've been working uh, very hard over the last uh, 18 months to, to build that out and got some more exciting uh, announcements coming up soon. That's great. And uh, so just to bring the other guys in, so uh, uh, Jay, we don't often have uh, the, the subject of the story in the room with us when we talk about <laughs> these things, but, you know, what are your thoughts on, 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 uh, on Bampage over the last uh, sort of year or so and, and the progress I've done? Uh, I mean, I, l I love the approach. I'm, I'm a huge, you know, vocal kind of uh, proponent or, or at least uh, talking head about the, the idea that I think fragmentation in the streaming services and the streaming market is going to continue to propagate. And I think the ability to be able to um, provide services across multiple streaming providers is, 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 you know, is an important and kind of growing uh, piece of the puzzle. So, yeah, uh, yeah I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of that. I think it's only, I think fragmentation and streaming services is only going to continue to um, uh, get worse or get better depending on how you look at it. Um, and so being able to provide some sort of way for bands to get closer to the fans across all the various touch points that, that people are interacting with them, I think is, uh, I think is great. So I'm, I'm, I'm a fan. Yeah, and Brian, on your front, of course, you know, you worked for many years at CD Baby and saw a lot of uh, connections there with uh, uh, young fans, uh, young artists that may well want to get their information in on as many platforms as possible, right? Yes, uh, and I, I agree. I think that fragmentation will happen over the near term, and I think that, um, that Bandpage is very, very well positioned to be able to provide a solution to get uh, everybody's information everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, sure, exactly. And uh, yeah, it's, it's been a long time, Jay, Jay since uh, we met at Mida. Uh, was that 2010 or 2011? Um, I, I think recall. that was 2011. 2011, if I right? Correctly. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot yeah. of stuff has happened since then, and uh, yeah. and it's great yeah. to see you guys also been endorsed by uh, you know Brian Message. That was a pretty great uh, quote on the press release. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Not a bad endorsement, really. You know, Radiohead uh, is, is I think, uh, my all-time favorite band. Uh, and so that was, you know, it's been great to get to know Brian and, uh, and the MMF um, and, uh, you know, have just incredible musicians see the value in, in what we're building. At, at the end of the day, that's why I started the company. You know, I'm, I'm a musician myself and managed bands and venues for a long time. And so my, my hope and dream was just to, you know, provide value to musicians around the world, and so I'm, I'm glad to see that, uh, you know, they believe in it as well. Yeah, absolutely. And Jay, yeah. well, uh, thanks so much for your time. You know, it was a real yeah. pleasure having you on the show, and uh, yeah. uh, hopefully we'll have you on again very soon. Okay. Thanks you guys so take care. Cheers. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Good seeing you. Awesome. Perfect. And we have transitioned without difficulties, and we continue. Look at that. That's, that's fancy. Very stuff. slick. That was very, that was very slick. <laughs> that's fancy stuff. And, uh, and so uh, after talking about uh, uh, Bandpage, uh, which was uh, uh, a great story, again, you know, uh, uh, seeing uh, how the company has uh, really managed, you don't see many startups that manage to pivot like that and, and really make it work uh, in this way. So that's, uh, that's fantastic. And I want to talk about Spotify. So Spotify, there was a big story today that came out uh, because uh, they released, uh, uh, finally, yay, it's like a fanfare. They released uh, their biggest uh, uh, redesign to date, uh, although it, they released it without much of a fanfare, actually, uh, which is interesting. Uh, they just uh, posted, you know, a, a, a video on their YouTube channel uh, showcasing the new design, and it's uh, it's rolled out to iOS already, but it's uh, still rolling out slowly to desktop clients, I think, because my clients have restarted it a bunch of times today, but I haven't managed to uh, get the update to come through. Uh, so uh, the update, which favors a dark background after a bunch of consumer research that they've done at the company, of course, uh, is a uh, dark to make the artwork pop, at least that's what the company said. It's very sleek with new fonts uh, and new feel to the app and it also brings a couple of, a couple of new features. Uh, one is a collection feature which aims to make it easier for users to navigate through the tracks uh, they have saved on their devices, so hopefully that will uh, get rid of the uh, scrolling syndrome through playlists on Spotify. And uh, the other is that they actually got rid of the star button, which I, I personally quite liked, but uh, they want to push people towards adding tracks to playlists outright and doing a bit more work on the curation front, so I wonder how that's going to play out but uh, I want to hear your your opinions I actually haven't managed to find this collection feature yet I'm wondering whether it's a client only a desktop client only feature or whether I don't know why it's not appearing on my phone uh, but <laughs> Jay what are your thoughts on the on the redesigns and, and, and have you managed to try out try it out yet yeah well, I have not managed to try it out yet although I'm very interested to uh, I'm on Android and right. so there there's no announcement of Android I like you have tried to uh, refresh my desktop client a couple times to, to try to see it but have not been uh, push the update. The interesting thing, and I, I did talk a little bit this morning about 
Uh, I thought it was an interesting choice to remove the star button, although it seems like they're A-B testing it because yeah. uh, I've gotten some reports from folks that have, you know, still have, you know, star track and others that ha have a save uh, button in its place. Yeah. Um, so obviously they're doing a little research there to figure out kind of how people behave. So uh, I'm interested in seeing it. it. It's funny, you know, we are, um, uh, the, the Tomahawk team is working on an Android um, app now and it's in beta and, and we actually started with, uh, really dark, and, and we're moving towards a lighter gray. So it, it's right. certainly some preference there in terms of uh, legibility and readability and things like that. Um, but the idea of adding a collection, I think, is, is a move in the right direction. Um, I think people are starting to get their heads around, like everything is not a playlist. Um, there was behavior that a lot of folks like myself, maybe the older folks, liked to collect, um, yeah. like to have things in their collection, like to me, that was a notice to myself. Like, yeah, I know that. I've listened to that. Uh, I liked it enough that I dragged it into into a collection. So, so I think overall, um, some 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 good positive moves. I look forward to seeing it. Um, you know, they they're calling this their 1.0 release, and I th certainly think that that is not coincidental given all the the, the increasing movement towards uh, IPO, or at least as all rumors indicate, IPO. So, yeah. certainly seems like they're getting all their ducks in a row. So, yeah, um, you know, congrats to them on that. Yeah. Uh, Brian, do you think that they were feeling a little bit of uh, hot under the collar with the, the release of Beats Music, for example? Uh, you know, I'm not sure that they're that... I can't... You, it's hard to tell whether a company that size is really that concerned over Beats or whether all the noise about Beats is just based on the reputation of the people involved and right. on, um, and on you know, just what we hear inside the Beltway in the, in the digital blogosphere. But, um, yeah, I'm, I've been a loyal RDO user for years. I was blown away by what RDO had released a couple years ago at South by Southwest. Uh, I had favored their app, but Spotify has shown, just with their scale and development, such an ability to roll out new features from artist tour dates and faster search and all of these, uh, you know, at curation and their international expansion, and now this with, the, with, this, with this attractive new redesign. Um, they're they're really really tough company, which is why I think that over the near term we will see fragmentation will continue to, but I do think it will settle out uh, after a couple of years. Yeah, and Brian, actually, uh, you talked about audio. That's a really I interesting point because uh, a lot of the articles that came out today commenting on this uh, new release were talking about the fact that uh, it, it it looks like they pinched a lot of features that you know and a lot of uh, uh, design features uh, that were on uh, both beats and audio uh, in order to come up with this release uh, uh, which of course is, is something that all companies do when there is a better product out there they you know like Apple does it all the time for example uh, so in that context do, do you think that it's gonna make it harder for uh, guys like audio to differentiate themselves in the marketplace considering that so far they've really been pushing this uh, uh, different uh, approach and the fact that you had collections and the fact that you had your own music uh, on there I think RDO was already having enough trouble. Um, I don't think that, that that their design was a unique selling proposition. I was I got to see it uh, just from having been at South by and having distributed all of our titles there. So um, I think that their problems are ones of marketing and scale and funding and all and all kinds of other things. I don't think that this is going to be any particular thing that hurts them. I think it's yeah. more of a validation that they have innovated and created something entirely beautiful. Yeah, I think sure. RDO has done something amazing and I wish them all the best. Absolutely, um, but yeah. Spotify is really just rolling along. Yeah, yeah, Jay, for, uh, for you, that, 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 does this make it harder for Beats to make the argument of, uh, look, we are the, the pretty app now? Um, you know, I think that uh, I think it's certainly going to become harder to differentiate as being, you know, the, the pretty one. Obviously, you know, Beats' uh, whole uh, marketing push and, and product perspective has been more around the curation than yeah. it just being pretty. So I think they will certainly continue to bang that drum. I know that they're hiring. There were some more announcements today about, you know, uh, some new marketing folks they hired, um, some kind of heavy hitters. So, uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be more about um, it, it's really boiling down to experts, Hiring experts to curate stuff for you, you just lean back and listen to it versus, uh, a, you know, kind of more the Spotify approach of we've yeah. got everything you want, you can find it, you can find other people, you can find other stuff. But um, uh, yeah, so, you know, it's certainly ramping up. The competition as a whole is ramping up. You know, we're still waiting for Amazon's shoe to drop, uh, still waiting for, you know, yeah. if Apple's shoe ever drops, um, which I don't think it necessarily will. But, uh, but certainly, I mean, uh, you know, the, the guys playing the game have all either grown to the size where they're extremely big or the extremely big guys 
are getting ready to play the game. So yeah. um, that obviously makes it very difficult for, for, for RDO and some of the others. Um, but, you know, it's probably the most interesting time in the space, I think, in, in the last, you know, eight or nine years in terms of what's going on. So it, yeah. it's fun to watch. Yeah, absolutely. It's fun to watch, you know, and uh, uh, we, of course, watch it uh, here every week. And uh, uh, all change at last FM uh, this week as the company announced that it will close down its internet radio service as of the 28th of April. Uh, so it no longer made sense for the company to shoulder the uh, costs attached to licensing of the, the radio product. And recently, the partnerships with uh, YouTube, which is still in beta, as I believe, uh, as a mean to provide access to its uh, playlists uh, features without having to pay for licensing, and also the integration with Spotify to allow users to log in with their Spotify uh, accounts uh, on Last.fm to play full-length tracks uh, had kind of given us a bit of a hint as to where the company was heading in, in, in this sense. Uh, the company will refocus on scrubbling and uh, the derived opportunities in recommendations. So scrubbling, of course, is still the key reason why most people uh, love and keep using uh, Last.fm. So, uh, um, you know, on that front, uh, Jay, do, do, were you surprised by this announcement at all? And uh, do you think uh, Last.fm can refine uh, uh, its way uh, through scrubbling and recommendations? Um, I'm not surprised by it at all. I think it's been a long time coming, um, and, and you know them looking to to to, to kind of extract themselves from uh, licensing deals is, is like I said, kind of been happening for for a long time. Um, uh, you know, I think that certainly with uh, the Equinus um, exiting to Spotify, I think there are a lot of people that are looking at the music data space, music recommendation space, as there's potentially a new opportunity to come in there because obviously. Yeah. Um, all the you know numerous customers of Equinus are all looking for 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 potential partners that don't power their com biggest competitor. Yeah. Um, so uh, you know I think that there is huge value in collecting data. I think there's a massive amount of opportunity um, to provide a, a a kind of social experience that bridges across multiple service providers and multiple subscription services. Yeah. Um, and, you know you will you will see. Um, uh, you know, projects that I'm involved in do much more in that space, um, and uh, so you know, I, th I think there's there's bigger opportunities now there than ever. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if CBS is shopping Last FM yeah. to some of the Spotify competitors at this point, uh, given it's probably their best opportunity to to, to kind of um, for CBS to kind of get themselves out of this space, which I think they probably. Um, you know, look back now and, and weren't sh quite sure what they were going to do with it. Exactly. And, and Brian, of course, uh, Last.fm didn't have much of a shot to, to compete against Pandora, uh, you know, at least uh, not of late, uh, given the size of Pandora right now in the US. Uh, and so uh, do you think this was the right play? And, and uh, do you reckon it, it will lead, uh, as I think as well, to, to some sort of uh, uh, divestment or, or, or uh, sell off of the company to somebody else that might make better use of, of the data they have? Uh, I, the answer is maybe. Uh, there, for the data part of the equation, I think that that could be useful um, as people look for solutions other than Echo Nest if they're positioned to use them. As far as their value with scrabbling and social sharing as, as a way of bridging across services, I'm not sure how much that's going to matter. A lot of services have already baked this into their platforms anyway. Um, and the ones that have baked it in, like REO, are not getting a ton of traction on it. Um, the social feature matters where you have a large social user base, and yeah. what that means is Spotify. So if they, if they can, I mean, right now they're bleeding money, um, and I'm sure CBS would want to unload them, and if they can harvest and mine the data or make use of it as a white label solution, they can get some value out of it. But otherwise, I, I really don't see a lot of there there. Yeah, yeah, sure. And talking about uh, uh, other data companies that are coming to the space after uh, the Econest acquisition, another company that I, I caught up with uh, yesterday uh, is uh, The Filter, which is a UK-based company that's been around since uh, uh, 2006, 2007. I actually interviewed them back in 20. 10, I think, uh, when I interviewed the CEO, who at the time was David Meher Roberts. Uh, now the CEO is James Routley. I had a quick chat with him yesterday. And they've launched a new product called Responsive Radio after being uh, out of the music space really for uh, a couple of years and uh, focusing more on, on other sides of, of recommendation that they were doing outside of music. Uh, this uh, new Responsive Radio uh, has got a seeded radio functionality, multi-seeded radio to create stations from favorites, uh, personalized, personalized radio, and uh, 
uh, it, it could provide uh, technology to both big brands that want to have their own web radios uh, and also a sort of uh, be a back-end solution for uh, more tech companies that want better recommendations on the platform. So, uh, Jay, do you think that we're going to see uh, more companies come into the space? And uh, do you reckon that there, there is a real market here? You know, because uh, even the Econest, uh, according to the rumors, didn't sell for you know, a, an insane amount of money. So the, the valuations there are not going to be uh, insane, right? Um, I, I mean, I would say this. I would say there's been more uh, strong exits for music data companies than for music uh, providers, right? So whether you look at Grace Note or, or originally Last FM or Echo Nest or any of those others, I would say there's a much higher success rate from, from that perspective than actually being from a, from a music license or, you know, music provider perspective. Um, so I do think that more people are going to come in. I think I saw something, and maybe you, you saw it. I thought I saw something about the Wawa guys. Yeah, sure. of, they, they were uh, actually sponsoring the show uh, uh, for my March and South by Southwest coverage, the Senzara guys. Right. So, uh, yeah, right. So I, I think you see a lot of people see an opportunity to really get their, their, their hands in there. So I think... Um, there will be some short-term opportunities for people to license, um, uh, you know, recommendations, data, uh, radio services. You see a lot of brands wanting to get into sponsored radio. Um, I think the guys like at, at Feed FM, you see a lot of that happening uh, where you've got a really easy, um, uh, uh, you know, offering for a brand to be able to say, hey, I want to have an embedded player on my site and I right. want it to provide, you know, radio. Um, so, you know, building that kind of DMCA logic in, in, in you know, uh, a set of APIs that allows them to really easily kind of seed and and, um, and uh, embed a radio station, I think you're going to see more of. So, yeah, so yeah I, think that, I, think there, I think there's opportunity. I think we will see more people kind of pop into this space. Yeah. Uh, Brian, in the indie space, uh, do you think that there's more opportunities there for uh, companies to do more when it comes to uh, recommended, uh, recommending similar artists within that ecosystem, for example, or creating communities uh, around the independent sector, or are they doing pretty well uh, as it is? Uh, perhaps neither. Yeah. <laughs> Meaning uh, that it, it, it's, it's tough with, uh, with, the, uh, with, with, the, with, with brands. I think that Feed FM is going to do well. I think that Jeff Yasuda is, is a proven capability of, to be able to develop um, a back end and integrations and uh, and a gorgeous front end uh, with with Blip and now with Feed. Uh, whether uh, companies can create the deals uh, with the brands is another story. Yeah. As far as with the independents, the the real issue is one: uh, independents uh, and aggregators thereof are making their money f from. Uh, from the fact that the gatekeepers have kind of collapsed and now the gatekeepers are the crowd. Right. So if uh, somebody's got you know, millions of tracks like a CD Baby or like a TuneCore uh, and it's uncurated, uh, it's a great thing because the cream can rise and you may never have been able to predict what the wisdom of the crowds would have uh, helped rise to the top. Yeah. But that doesn't necessarily mean that people are going to want to dig within the micro genres, and we had 850 micro genres at CD Baby, whether they're really going to want to discover. Uh, and as a lot of these sort of listen services have shown, uh, is that people often, most of the plays are from the top 100 artists by and large. And people think they want to discover, but at the end, they want to listen to what they want to listen to, and they want to listen to maybe in some cases a buzz thing of what's social and viral on the social uh, networks or, or on YouTube. Yeah. So there, there is there, there's a, a, some percentage, like maybe 15% or something, that does want to discover, but how will the recommendation engines really be able to weed through such varying uh, quality uh, issues that you would get from long tail content? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and, uh, you know, talking about, um, uh, I wanted to go back to audio that we talked about earlier just because um, I wanted to move on to talking about connected devices and connected TVs. And uh, uh, so one of the things that uh, is, uh, is really becoming an, an important uh, story for the last couple of months is the rise of uh, uh, TV boxes or some sort of way of accessing the internet through uh, your TV. Of course, Chromecast only debuted in the UK uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I think it's selling really well. Uh, it's priced at 30 pounds, I believe here, uh, 35 dollars in the in the US. Uh, um, 
uh, Chromecast uh, has announced uh, the uh, Ardio app, which is its, its first uh, on-demand uh, streaming service that is added to uh, the Google Box. And uh, this is good because it means that Google is not going to be uh, restricting the Chromecast ecosystem to its own products. So that's, that's a good sign. It means that we're probably going to see more of those apps come out. And, and props to Ardio for uh, being the first one on the, on the device, given that it's actually having a lot of traction right now. And uh, uh, of course, there were a bunch of stories around Amazon in the last couple of weeks. Uh, people were speculating they were going to launch uh, uh, a video music service that was going to be free, ad-funded, and then uh, there's, there's been a lot of stories around Amazon wanting to do an actual streaming service on demand, but offering too little to the labels, and, and there were a lot of rumors that were not substantiated by any anything really concrete other than uh, uh, sources say that. And so, uh, on, on that front, uh, do you think that uh, the battle for the living... Uh, Amazon actually uh, just finished a press conference, I, I need to add that as well, uh, where they announced that their uh, Fire TV box, so it's a box priced at $99. Uh, they uh, believe it's the fastest box out there. It's got a quad core processor, two gigs of RAM, a bunch of features on it, and uh, uh, it's seen as an open ish ecosystem because uh, they have they allow companies to develop apps for the box uh, so that they can uh, work uh, themselves uh, into that. I'm not sure what the tech is behind it or how easy it is to integrate the, the apps, but uh, there you go. Uh, and uh, in the screenshot I saw, the Amazon Firebox had two music related apps. Uh, uh, actually three, I think I had, it had iHeartRadio, it had uh, Pandora, and it had Vivo uh, that I spotted, but I didn't spot any on-demand streaming services as of yet. Uh, so, uh, uh, Jay, what, what do you make of this uh, new uh, burgeoning uh, uh, this living room accessibility of streaming services? Do you think it's going to uh, supersede accessibility by phones, for example? Or there's going to be a relationship between the two? It, it, it does feel like the two things are very disconnected uh, right now, right? Yeah, I mean... I, I... You know, I think it's uh, I, I think it's interesting. I I listen to music, kind of coming from my TV setup, but I'm old and I have floor speakers, right? Like I've got a real receiver. Um, I don't know how common that is. You know, for for a lot of folks, jamming a, a you know a, a, a Chromecast dongle into the back of their TV and listening to it out of the TV speaker certainly is not going to be better than listening to it out of your you know whatever kind of standalone uh, speaker you have set up you know dock for your iPhone or whatever. So um, so I think there's a little bit of a disconnect there. I think the battle for the living room is you know kind of a, a, a much bigger battle for ultimately home automation and, and who's going to be the center of everybody's lives. Yeah. Uh, I think the streaming services to those is you know is nice. I think obviously they skewed much more towards the lean back radio services because because navigating uh, an on-demand service with a remote is extremely painful, much easier to do it from your phone or from your laptop and, and beam it to whatever that device is. So, sure. um, you know, I think it's kind of a nice to have for, for music on there if you happen to have, uh, you know, a real home audio setup. If not, it's, you know, it's, it's just kind of is what it is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Brian, do you think this is the next wave of access accessing music in the, in the home? Or do you still think, uh, you know, there's a lot of companies betting on mobile right now when it comes to home accessibility? What Jay said. What Jay said. Okay, cool. <laughs> I mean, I do, I, I do think it's interesting that you know everybody is looking at Sonos's business right now. Like, wow, you know, whatever they reported almost six hundred million dollars in revenue last year, I think. And so you see a bigger trend towards people focused on the devices that compete directly with Sonos. And I think some of the other guys are like, well, we're doing video, and we can throw a couple of uh, you know music features in, and maybe that helps us grab a little piece of that pie. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the fight for the Sonos market, I think, is much more interesting when it comes to when it when it comes to music services in the living room. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, merch, actually. Uh, and this is a story that uh, I kind of discovered today by chance. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure it's been covered by anybody else yet, but uh, I wanted to quickly uh, cover it uh, here. Uh, and uh, it looks like uh, you know uh, Topspin uh, Topspin's uh, uh, platform, uh, which is uh, the uh, merch-related side of the company, the e-commerce-related side of the company, has been uh, acquired or invested in uh, by a company called the Transom Capital uh, Group. Uh, so this company is a, is a, a, a group that has uh, also properties like Ban Merch and uh, Cinderblock, uh, who have merged together pretty recently, creating the uh, largest full-service independent merchandising company in the United States. And whilst they have uh, they 
has been no announcement. I have uh, uh, stumbled ac across uh, the, uh, uh, the Trans Transform website, and they have uh, uh, Top Spin Media as one of their, of their investments, and they list uh, the investment as being April 2014, and they talk about the platform as uh, a merge thing. So there could well be a synergy here between this huge merchandising company, uh, which is the Ban Merge and Cineblock, and uh, uh, Top Spin's uh, platform, which would be pretty cool because, uh, of course, uh, uh, Top Spin has also been built to scale. So uh, that would be a pretty uh, uh, interesting integration and creating a, a pretty big group of merchandise. So uh, as uh, you know, merchandise, of course, uh, South by was a, a key part of the conversation. People were talking about it all the time uh, at panels. Uh, that were addressing how musicians still make money, especially on the road. Uh, and so this could be a big deal. So uh, Jay, on, on your front, uh, do, do you feel like uh, this could be a good home for the uh, Top Spin flat platform that wasn't really, didn't really fit into uh, Beats Music uh, plans? I, I mean, it seems to be a, a, a you know kind of first pass. Um, yeah. You know, my knowledge of the of the merch business is is uh, admittedly. Too. Yeah. yeah, no, not that, not that strong. I but I mean, I think there's <laughs> there is a big opportunity there, and I think it's the opportunity is, is made even more um, uh, uh, kind of apparent by the by the movements like Jay Sider was showing us with fan page or with the the artist link side of Top Spin's business of a, how do you connect fans, uh, you know, artists more closely directly to their fans, which is great. So you're going to get all this distribution into these uh, various kind of streaming services and what have you. But somebody ultimately still needs to fulfill that merch. Yeah. Um, so so you know making a play to try to be the default um, kind of merch provider that powers all those uh, you know goes up against guys like Bravado and other stuff. I think. I think it's an interesting play and definitely something I'm going to do some more research into. Yeah, sure. Uh, Brian, it's funny, right, that how uh, merch is so important, yet artists are still so confused about it. Like, there isn't one overarching way of doing it, and uh, there's a lot of people that can help you with it, but uh, it's, it's kind of hard to navigate your way through it. At the panels that I was mentioning, there were a lot of questions from artists that were very basic uh, as to, you know, even just how you find the context to get it printed, and uh, there's a lot of fragmentation in the marketplace, that's what, I, that's what I'm trying to say. So, uh, how come do you think there hasn't been much more consolidation in the space? Uh, well, merch is a tough, tough nut to crack is why. I um, I started the merch program for Disc Makers and we tried to integrate it with CD Baby, but the fact is is that um, there's the on-demand stuff still isn't quite of the quality that on-demand, for example, CD duplication is. Right. The margins are small and the shipping and fulfillment and returns are a lot harder. Like a CD or some kind of download card or something yeah. that... They're, they're easy things to, to store, they're easy to pick, pack, and ship, they're easy to fill. Merch, you've got to get the right colors, and you've got to get exactly the right size, which may or may not fit, and you've got to order in a certain quantity to make the screen printing worthwhile. Yeah. Um, and it's just, it, it's hard for the long tail to make uh, and fulfill a really quality product easily. Yeah, and it's uh, also whereas, more prone to returns as well, right? Yes, yes. Whereas, you know, if, if you are a touring artist uh, and you're touring the U.S. for months on end at, at, sh at shows, you can make them and sell them and store them and, and you can make money on them. I don't know if it's enough money for most artists, except for the tip of the long tail, yeah. to be something that can really save this generation of content creators. I don't think that, that merch in and of itself is going to do it. Um, but I still don't think that right now as we speak, there's a tremendous solution for everybody where they can make good incremental income and deliver a quality product easily. Yeah. Um, I think on-demand printing is an amazing thing. I just don't think it's necessarily something that's going to move the needle for everybody just yet. Yeah, sure. And it's, it's funny actually how it feels like in the U.S. Uh, the conversation around merch is much more important. Uh, I mean, not that it's not important in the UK, but it just feels like uh, the number of dates that artists can play in the UK is relatively limited because <laughs> you know it's not a huge place. Whilst in the States, an artist can be on the road for like three months and, and, and never go to the same place again. And, and that, I guess, opens up a little bit more uh, opportunities to, to shift more merch if you're seeing more people every day, right? <laughs> yes, but that, that is just a sliver of artists. I mean, if you're over 40, you're not selling a lot of units uh, or not a trust fund baby, it's, it, the idea of couch surfing at that age is going to wear thin. So it, it's a sliver of the artist, and the sliver does really well, but, it's, uh, but there's also volume in the aggregate too. Yeah, yeah, sure, of course. And uh, uh, going from uh, 
the uh, talking about merch talking about live uh, and some problems going on at the ultra music festival i was just in miami actually last week and i left uh, just before ultra really got uh, going because i was there for the miami music summit which was great actually by the way uh, and uh, so uh uh, the Ultra Music Festival had some uh, hit some uh, troubles uh, during the weekend. Uh, unfortunately, there were uh, 76 uh, uh, arrests, uh, 118 had to be assisted by paramedics uh, for uh, problems of all sorts. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, uh, there was uh, one tragedy, actually two tragedies. Uh, the first, the first one was the fact that uh, the guard Eric and Mac was trampled upon by a group of festival goers that were trying to enter the the, the festival without uh, the appropriate tickets, apparently, and is now in critical conditions, uh, although it looks like uh, she, she may be able to pull through. And uh, the other one was the death of a 21-year-old uh, who uh, felt ill uh, during the uh, festival and, and got brought back to the car and, and, and then uh, unfortunately died. So um, this uh, has led uh, the uh, mayor of Miami, uh, of Miami to actually uh, say that he doesn't want the festival to go back to the city. He's, uh, he's uh, trying to uh, find ways to uh, uh, essentially withdraw uh, the permit for the festival for our next year so it's, it's a pretty big deal for Miami because ultra is uh, very much associated with the city and uh, uh, it's not a great start to the EDM festival season uh, of uh, 2014 uh, uh, you know, I don't know if this is going to have any long-term effects. Uh, of course, uh, we've had uh, another uh, horrible tragedy at South by Southwest uh, last month, uh, which is just uh, near where I was saying uh, during South by. Uh, but uh, I, I don't know. Do you think, Jay, that this may t might have s some effect on on uh, uh, EDM festivals for, for the rest of the year, or is it just a one-off uh, uh, issue given by the size of the festival? Uh, I, I mean, it's a good question, and I don't really know the, the answer to it. I, you know, I think it is interesting to kind of note that some of the bigger festivals, obviously, uh, whether it be Bonner or Coachella or something, any of those things, are, you know, are not in cities, and they're kind of out in the middle of nowhere to, to try to, you know, can, you know, contain slash minimize kind of any of the overflow issues that may have. So I don't know if that's going to be a bigger trend where they're yeah. going to become more kind of destination, like, whoop. <laughs> uh, uh, whether that's just going to, um, you know, kind of affect that or or, or what? But um, <laughs> did, did, did your light just go out or somebody? Just yeah, apparently, like a motion sensitive light. I wasn't moving enough. For. Hold on, I'll be right back. You guys, yeah, going. sure, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and Brian, I don't know if you have any comments on this, but it's it's definitely a very sad story. And uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know whether that's going to affect festivals going forward. But uh, it's uh, it's definitely going to be strange to see Ultra out of Miami, right? Yeah, I mean, it's every time they have a festival gathering of certain size. Uh, firstly, there's some risk of something happening. Yeah. Secondly, they really need to do better security, especially on the bum rushing of the show, because. This happens whether there's a tragedy or not, this, everywhere. It's happened multiple years at South by and other conferences. Um, and thirdly, there are local politicos that want the thing gone or want to appear blameless, right. while meanwhile they've been reaping all the economic benefits of having this great event that brings in lots of tourists into their backyard. Exactly. So, and then there's the media idiots who will just go on and say, has it gotten too big? Has it jumped the shark? Uh, the answer is, I mean, EDM jumped the shark when it stopped being house music. That doesn't yeah. necessarily mean that EDM <laughs> is, uh, is, is going away. It means yeah. that it'll evolve and become something else and possibly called something else. And has South by jumped the shark? I mean, heck, back in 1997, they were saying it was too corporate. So uh, these, everything is just going to go on uh, probably as it was. They'll make some local changes. And as far as the the, fest, the so-called festival season, if they sell the tickets and if they go off without violence, it'll all be fine and forgotten. And if not, uh, then there might be more industry-wide changes. But industry-wide changes are few and far between, generally. Yeah. Yeah, sure. And uh, I wanted to close by talking a little bit about uh, a Mark Mulligan's piece. It was called uh, Music You Bad Puts the Rise of Listen Services into Numbers that came out uh, this week. And so Mark uh, was very insightful in his blog posts. Uh, and he talks about uh, Music You Bad uh, Numbers, uh, uh, which were released uh, uh, at the first anniversary of the company, uh, with some performance metrics uh, uh, that uh, make us think about the consumption of music here in the UK. So for example, 85% of UK radio play comes from the top 120 tracks. Uh, 
so and uh, you know the forgotten fan which is above average listening but below average spend accounts for 30 percent of consumers uh, you know the music you bad had uh, users uh, listen to 30 minutes uh, every day uh, to uh, the uh, their service 30 uh, percent of all active users are subscribers uh, and the o2 tracks which is uh, the o2's uh, uk music service powered by music you bad has a 60 percent female users and an average lifetime value of 33 pounds uh, you know this is uh, interesting because Mark calls this uh, a listen service, so a service uh, that sits at the opposite end, in his words, of the sophistication spectrum to access services which are Spotify and Deezer. Uh, so in, in his opinion, uh, this is part of the fourth wave of streaming, uh, uh, which comes after Napster, iTunes and Spotify. Uh, and uh, it tries to address the consumers that may not want to spend as much money as 120 pounds uh, uh, or dollars per, per year uh, and they might not want access to 30 million tracks but they might be willing to spend some money on a more curated uh, and uh, you could even say more limited experience that costs less so uh, we've seen a, a few of these come out in the uk we've seen music too bad with uh, o2 tracks we've seen uh, uh, bloom fm which is doing pretty well they announced uh, uh, having a million registered users uh, uh, last month uh, in the us we haven't seen that, that much shifting around pricing maybe because because Pandora does feel uh, fill that sort of uh, 4.99 price point. So uh, I don't know, uh, Brian. Do you think that the scope in the US for uh, some services trying out different formulas, uh, as far as uh, streaming is concerned, to try and lure in people that might not want to pay uh, ten dollars a month? You know, I, I think they got to try everything. Uh, I, I don't see a lot of future in this particular model uh, because. Heck, uh, you know, if I can get the top 100 stuff on YouTube, uh, why would I want to pay for the top 100 stuff? And if I can't be enticed to pay $10 a month for the entire history of Western recorded music, which I, I used to when I was when I was a young tot, I was paying, you know, $18.99 for a, a CD if I had to. Uh, and now $10 is suddenly too much for me to listen to everything. So... Why would I want to pay some intermediate amount to hear a very select amount? Because the, the select stuff I'm going to hear or see on YouTube anyway, it, it, it just doesn't seem terribly plausible to me. Right. But yeah, I'm not that impressed by you know their average lifetime value of 33 pounds. That's not a lot of money. Um, and you know, I, I sure hope that people see the value in music, that music is not just background fodder to sync against video, film, or TV. I hope that people will pay for music and see the value in perhaps even curation, but this sort of, okay, you get the top tier for some intermediary price because somehow $10 for everything is too much, it just doesn't sit with me, but I'm yeah. just one guy. Yeah, sure. Uh, Jay, uh, what are your thoughts? Do you think we might see a few more players come into the market in the US with a, a different price, price point? I think Slacker actually is, is one that does offer a few different price points. I think you'll see a lot of people try a, a lot of stuff. Um, you know, I'm with Brian. I mean, I think curation is a feature um, of, of a larger product. And a bit, the big step into music service is not from, you know, $2 to $10. It's from $0 to, you know, one penny. Yeah. Um, so, so you know, the hard part is to get anybody in. And, and you know, uh, the, as terms of like a fourth wave of listen services, I would argue that that that's, listen services are the second and a half wave, right? I mean, Pandora and Last of M Radio were, were, were happening before Spotify and, yeah. and others. So, um, you know, there's definitely value in uh, lean back experiences. And I think people have voted mm -hmm. with their actions for a long time that they like really simple experiences. And so whether curation you know, provides that really simple experience or just a giant play button or what have you, I think you'll see more people kind of adding those features on top of you know, an all-you-can-eat service. And, and I'm with Brian. You know, I think $10 for a music service is, is a hell of a bargain. Um, and you know, my hope is that more people are going to realize that, that that's a bargain. And, yep. and you know, we'll see lots of interesting kind of pro programmatic layers on top of you know the, those services um uh but yeah so so you know i think you'll see people try different price points i think ultimately it's it, it's not really going to have that big of an impact um i think you'll see more people building interesting services on top of uh the the all you can eat backs kind of apis of spotify deezer rdo uh, beats whomever 
Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. And, and uh, the, actually, following up from that, uh, there was a piece by uh, Janko Rodger, a gigaom, uh, who uh, talked about this uh, new company, but well, this uh, uh, sort of uh, rebirth of the company Raditas uh, into uh, uh, Cure Media. So Raditas uh, closed down last year and uh, pulled out, pull, pull, pulled uh, the plug uh, on the service. It was a Pandora competitor, and now uh, Cure Media has come out of of that, uh, uh, raising 9.6 million dollars in a reverse merger, and uh, they plan to launch a new service later this year which uh, they essentially classify as a, as a Pandora Plus. Uh, essentially, it, it, it gives you a lot of the Pandora-like radio features with a few on-demand like uh, Spotify-like services. So uh, it will be targeted at people who use Pandora but want something more, and I would imagine it will be priced accordingly. So it's going to be a company that definitely we can look out for, although it's going to be very difficult to tackle Pandora at this point. Uh, maybe uh, iTunes Radio can do it, but a new startup is going to be very tough, uh, although we've seen songs that do pretty well in the US. Uh, um, now, finally, I wanted to... Uh, uh, you know, ask you about any plugs that you want to do. Uh, Jay, uh, tell us a little bit about the state of, of Tomahawk. And also wanted to ask you, uh, actually while we're here, I wanted to ask you the, your take on uh, the Sonos Universal Search uh, that they rolled out. You know, that made me think of Tomahawk in a sense. So uh, what was your take on that? Yeah, no, I, I, I applaud the, the addition of Sonos to Universal Search. It's been kind of a, a much needed feature for a long time. And uh, I'm always happy when people realize that you have to be start thinking outside the silo and start thinking about, I just want to play something and I don't really care where it comes from as long as it comes from one of the services that I have access to. So, uh, so you know, uh, uh, that's great. The new Sonos Android app is you know, a, a massive step forward for them. So I'm a big fan of, of what they're doing there. Uh, myself, obviously... Um, uh, Tomahawk, get Tomahawk.com, uh, still available for desktop, uh, OS X, Windows, Linux. Um, we have a Android uh, beta for Tomahawk that's okay. uh, kind of in limited distribution now. We're very excited about that, that and that all connects to a new um, service that I'm working on with the core team from Tomahawk called Hatchet. Um, and Hatchet, we've, um, we've teased a little bit um, in terms of just what we want to be and what problems we want to solve. But... Uh, one of the things that Hatchet does is just provides the ability to sync all of your playlists and, and, and behavior from your desktop apps to your mobile Android app. Um, but then there's a whole lot more kind of on top of that. And so we will be opening up that beta uh, in the coming weeks to kind of a much larger audience. Um, awesome. But yeah, we, it, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's exciting and, and we're really happy with um, where it's going. And we've gotten some interesting kind of interests from people that, that wouldn't necessarily have expected interest from that are reaching out to us and want to figure out maybe ways that we can do some stuff together. So awesome. totally vague again, as I always kind of am. I totally but, uh, expect a, a beta. <laughs> I, I totally expect an invite to the beta. Uh, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, cool. Well, that's again, it's uh, tomahawk.com. Is that right? No, it's uh, gettomahawk.com. Gettomahawk.com. I always forget that. Uh, Brian, uh, anything to plug? And if you don't have anything to plug, anything to recommend? It can be apps, music, whatever you want. Uh, not at all. Not at not all. all. Uh, <laughs> no, no. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, I left CD Baby a month ago and uh, been helping some companies come into the U.S. And uh, I'm in Los Angeles, excited about what lies ahead. Okay, great, awesome. So uh, yeah, it's uh, it's been a fun show, uh, definitely. And it was great to have Jay as well at the beginning. It's the first time I try and do this, but it seemed to work. So hopefully, I'm going to be able to implement this in more shows. And if companies have news, breaking news, I can bring people in for five minutes on Skype uh, whilst the show is recording. And uh, hopefully, nothing will break in the meantime. And <laughs> so, guys, it was a real pleasure having you on. Thanks so much for uh, coming on. Great. Thanks Love for it. having me. Yeah. And Good thanks so much for uh, listening to Digital Music Trends. Uh, the show comes out every week. You can find it on digitalmusictrends.com. You can also search for it on the iTunes Store on the podcast app, of course. Uh, and uh, we have a YouTube channel on youtube.com slash digitalmusictrends. Make sure you tune in every week. There's also a one-to-one -one show where I interview... Uh, the interesting companies, interesting projects in the music tax space. Every week, again, it comes out uh, and it's available on all the channels that I mentioned previously. And finally, there's a new events feed that uh, should be out uh, next week on iTunes uh, with all the interviews I did at South by Southwest, which were 30 interviews plus, uh, which you can access on demand. So that's fun. But you can also find those on SoundCloud and YouTube as well. So thanks so much for listening. Have a fantastic week. And until next time. <laughs> <laughs>